Okay, good evening. As we're getting closer to the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, I decided to give a special lecture, an important lecture, on the topic of forgiveness. Many of us are familiar with the word, with the term forgiveness, but we don't really understand what it's all about, how important it really is, and what is its effect, what does forgiveness really accomplish, what are the benefits that one sees from forgiving. The better we will understand this topic, the more it will help us understand the essence, the meaning of Yom Kippur. What is Yom Kippur all about? The Day of Atonement. What exactly are we atoning? What's the difference between atonement and forgiveness? So let's begin by describing relationships. There's two basic types of relationships in life that we encounter. And that is the relationship between man and man, as it's called in Hebrew, ben adam lechavero, and the relationship ben adam lamakom, between us and God. They're very distinct, but there's a lot of commonality between the two. There's different factors that make up relationships, different things. The relationship of a father and, and his son or his daughter is one type of relationship. It's more instinctive. It's very strong, but it's different than two friends. It's different than the relationship between a husband and wife. These are all relationships between man and man. They can be very powerful for different reasons, because there's different things that make up the connection between them. However, as powerful as relationships can be, they can also fall apart. We see this all the time. Friends who are no longer friends, brothers and sisters who are no longer getting along, parents who are no longer together with their children, for different reasons. Relationships, as good as they may have been in the past, can break up. And that is exactly what happens sometimes between man and God. Man sometimes drifts. His relationship is weakened. And the question is why? What exactly has happened when a relationship weakens, when it falls apart? Let's just focus on one item for now, because there's different factors, there's different things that can weaken a relationship. But the basic idea that we need to know is what is a chet? A chet is a sin. A sin is an offense. When an offense is committed against an individual, against another human being, or against God, what it produces, that chet, that sin, that offense, is a violation of the trust that existed once upon a time. So, simplistically, just using basic definition of what is a chet, of what is an offense, it's a violation of the trust that may have existed once upon a time. What happens when the trust is violated? So, let's take an example from the Kabbalah in how it describes the relationship between us and Hashem. In observing the mitzvot, it's not just following the instructions of God. Every mitzvah that Kabbalah teaches is like a thread. And there are many threads, 613 threads, making up this very strong rope, I guess we can call it. A rope. A rope that can connect us and Hashem. A connection. A powerful link. And this link can be severed, God forbid. This link can be weakened. How? If one thread is missing, it's already weak. It's weaker. The more threads are missing or broken, the weaker the connection will be, the weaker that rope, that cord will be. And it will suffer. And the same thing happens between human beings, the same thing happens between a husband and a wife. But the question right now, what I want to cover right now is, okay, mistakes happen in life. Can it be fixed? Can that cord be repaired? Can the relationship heal? That's the more important question right now. And the answer is yes, it's possible. Some are more difficult and some are more easier. 
What does it depend on? It also depends on the type of offense. What exactly happened? What did the man do wrong? What did the woman do wrong? What went wrong in the relationship between us and God? So you will encounter in the Torah different definitions of sin. One is called Chet, one is called Avon, one is called Pesha. There are different words and they mean different things. Even though they mean some sort of offense, it's a different degree of an offense. Just like you have in criminal law. You have what's called, hey, you have a misdemeanor. You have more serious crimes, right? Lesser crimes. The same is true in the Torah. Something that is a hit is something that was done unintentional, by mistake. Didn't realize it, didn't know about it. There's something called avon, which is intentional, or at least knowingly. And then there's something even more serious called pesha, in spite. There was one did not care. One knew the seriousness of his crime, not only what he was doing, but he knew that this is completely wrong, and he still did it. And you can imagine, that's the worst one of all. One of the biggest mistakes that people make is that they think that when they commit an offense against someone, they have hurt that someone, that individual. What they don't realize, which is very, very important, is that they have done something to themselves as well. As a result of this mistake, as a result of this sin, something has happened to the individual who committed the sin. It's important to pay close attention to everything I'm going to say because this is very relevant. This is a topic that we can learn a lot from and it can be very useful in our life. How a sin affects us, not just the one who we wronged. The Kabbalah teaches that every hit, depending of course on its severity, leaves behind a stain on the soul. Now, we don't see it because we don't see our soul. We see our physical body and we know what a stain on the physical body is, on a garment, that we recognize. But the Kabbalah teaches that we have a soul, of course, and there's something called a ketem or a stain on the soul that's left behind as a result of a het, as a result of a sin. So, what's wrong with a stain? A stain on the soul has tremendous consequences, as we will see some of them. We can't just ignore it. It is serious. Just a little bit to understand what it does to us. Remember the verse, the Pasuk, in Mishlei. Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam. The candle of God is the soul of the human being. It's like a candle. It's full of light, spiritual light because its source is from the great light. We're calling it light even though it's not exactly the light that we see here. It's something spiritual. So the soul is a light, a form of light. And when one commits a sin, imagine one light bulb or a part of the light is diminished or extinguished. It's no longer the same. It doesn't shine as much. And when that happens, the individual who committed the sin, the offense, doesn't feel right. Something is not right. He doesn't feel good. What does it mean not to feel good? Let's just take, for example, a mood. Sometimes we're not in a good mood. We're down. Think of it like that, even though it's a lot more than that. We just don't feel right. We feel down. For no obvious reason. It's not that we're disappointed at someone. Something did not go right for us. It just we don't feel good. And this could be as a result of a light that is diminished in the soul. When we feel that, it also is describing this distance that we are sensing we are from the ultimate light. Somehow, subconsciously, the neshama, the soul, feels distant. And the more serious the sin, the greater the distance. And the more the person will feel no good. And he will never be able on his own to figure it out. What's wrong with me? Unless somebody teaches him and points it out to him. You know, it's interesting how we barely understand illnesses of the physical body, where they come from, how to treat them. Barely understand those. 
we for sure don't have an inkling as to the illnesses of the soul. This is not something that is taught in any university. The Kabbalah speaks about it. But the average individual doesn't even realize it, that he is ill to some extent. It's not the same kind of illness as a physical illness which you actually feel, but there's definitely something there that we are experiencing and sometimes we don't know what it is. Speaking about consequences, so the stain is there. This individual committed the wrong. One of those consequences will be, depending again on the seriousness of his offense, that his prayer will not be accepted upstairs. He's praying day and night. He's begging God, pleading for help in some situation that he needs God's help. No response, no change. What's going on? The prayer is not being heard. So that distance that I just mentioned before produces this. This is the consequence. The prayers can no longer go where they're directed, where they're supposed to go. What does it feel like? It feels like, the Kabbalah says, as though there's a barrier. Can't get through to this barrier. And he was talking about someone who's crying his heart out. He is praying. He's crying his heart out. Somehow it doesn't work. Obviously, there must be something wrong. There's some barrier holding back the prayer from getting through. What's worse than this? Another consequence is that for every sin that is not forgiven, that Hashem has not forgiven, it creates a prosecuting angel, a kitrug. And that prosecution, from time to time, opens up the books. It says, I have something to say about this individual. And that happens whenever that individual who committed an offense asks for favors, wants to get married, wants to settle down. And somehow things are not working out for him. It's possible, not always, that this is due to an accusation. There are other factors, there are other reasons, there are other causes. And one of them being the mazal of the individual, not necessarily he did something wrong. It would take a tremendous knowledgeable Kabbalists, perhaps, to figure this out. We can never know precisely what it is, but we can guess. A lot of people have told me, Rabbi, somebody must have cast a spell on me. Witchcraft. This is not right. This is wrong. Who told you it's that? Perhaps you committed a wrong. Perhaps you hurt someone's feelings. You know what that can do to your mazal? Do you have any idea that these are, are very dangerous? In other words, they have serious consequences. There could be a very, very powerful kitrug accusation against you as a result of doing something terrible, embarrassing someone. We take it lightly. Ah, oh, I just said some words, right? Words don't do anything. No, the words do a lot of damage. It's not only to the individual, remember, it's to yourself. It's to the, to the person who actually said those bad words. So here we're talking about accusations that could be out there interfering with our life. But there's something worse than that. The rabbis tell us something incredible. What should you feel bad about if you committed the wrong? What's the worst thing that can happen? It's ta'er al shemiftah lo petah. The rabbis tell us in the Midrash, you should feel bad that now there's an opening out there. You have just created an opening. You've just made it easier for yourself in the future to commit an additional wrong. In other words, that the rabbis tell us, avera goreret avera. One sin leads to another. It's like a snowball, a snowball effect. All of a sudden, this individual who was always careful not to do the wrong things, now it's just easier. How come it's easier? Because he's done it once. Whether he's done one thing at once or he's done other things, it makes no difference. He has opened up the door. Imagine being a guest at the Satan's house. You know, you've entered. You've allowed yourself entry. You've done something which is not right. So long as it's not corrected, of course, it has terrible consequences. It could snowball. And it could go on and on and on without stop unless somehow we stop it. So the distance can become greater and greater. 
And by the way, this happens in marriages too. If we don't get it under control, whatever it is, the problem that's there, it can only get worse and worse and worse. It started off by being disrespectful, it can go on to abuse, it can go on to worse things. Unless you stop it. Somehow, one has to stop the arguments that the man and the woman are having because it can only get worse. So, the question is, the million dollar question is, how can we stop? What is the brakes to stopping someone from losing himself, from making things get worse for himself, whether it's the connection between him and Hashem, or whether it's between husband and wife? What are the brakes? What's going to put a stop to the snowball effect? And the answer is forgiveness. That is why I'm calling the lecture Forgiveness, the missing link. Because you're going to soon see how this is what will make the link or not. This is what will keep the relationship together, intact or not. Forgiveness has a chance of stopping the situation from getting any worse. I have some news to tell you, some good news. It will not only stop the situation from getting any worse, it also has the potential for healing. Remember we asked before, can it be healed? Can a bad situation be repaired? Yes, the answer is mechila, forgiveness. It has the power to heal. The way to actually see it in reality is by seeing how there is this commonality between teshuva, between us and Hashem, repentance, and the relationship between husband and wife, what they need to do. In other words, the things that husband and wife need to do to heal the relationship are very similar to what we need to do to heal our relationship with Hashem. There's this commonality. So where is that commonality? What do they have in common? You may recall that to do proper teshuva, to repent, to come closer to God, you need three things. You need vidui, harata, and kabbalah le'atid. Vidui means to confess, harata means to have remorse, and kabbalah le'atid means to make a commitment that you will not do what you used to do that was wrong, or that you will undertake to do what you needed to do and have not. Three, those three are important in order to free oneself from the chains of sin. You want to free yourself? You don't want it to be repeated again, God forbid? You need all three. Why three? Why these particular three? Because these three represent different aspects of our expression, of our behavior, of our essence. You have one that is done with our mind, right? That is, or with our heart, that is the remorse that we feel. You have the vidui that we use, that we do with our speech. And then we have action. As there is a saying in Russian, in other languages, actions speak louder than words. <laughs> so you don't just want to promise. You don't just want to feel bad. You want to take it one step further, and that is to take action, to commit yourself, to start a new path in life. If you don't start, you just think about it, you feel bad, you regret, that's very good. You have to have that too, but it's not enough. So in order to free oneself from the chains of hataim of sins, you need all three. If you accomplish all three, then there's a chance that Hashem will forgive. Hashem will accept the Teshuvah as being a sincere form of repentance. The same happens between husband and wife. Those three have a parallel. What is the parallel in the relationship between husband and wife? Well, vidui, confession, is communication. You have to talk things out. You cannot allow for misunderstandings. You need to be clear. What exactly did you do that's wrong? What is not acceptable? You have to talk. Communication, very important. Something that people do not do enough. Communicate to each other how you feel. Then comes the parallel or the equivalent of harata. Harata was remorse. In a relationship between husband and wife, it's called apology. Yes, something which sometimes people have a hard time doing. The man or the woman, either one, apologize. It doesn't cost too much money to apologize, but you have to be real. Apologize, you know what it does, not just to the person who you hurt, 
but to the whole relationship, to yourself. You actually brought it out of yourself to apologize. That is incredible. That is admirable. It takes a lot of courage to do that sometimes. See the parallel? Then comes Kabbalah Latid, commitment. You commit yourself to Hashem. This is what I plan to do the coming year. You commit to your spouse. We're going to stop doing it this way. We're going to do it differently. And you actually do it. Not just words, but you actually do it. So there's a parallel or commonality between what is necessary to improve the relationship between us and Hashem and between a husband and wife. What will this accomplish? So between us and Hashem, we're seeking Hashem's teshuvah. We're seeking Hashem's forgiveness. And that's great. Hashem says, fine, I know you're sincere. I can tell if you're sincere or not, and I will forgive you, give you a second chance. What happens here in this world between human beings who forgive each other, remember what we said before? What does an offense do? It violated the trust. Well, this rebuilds the trust. So when one does these things, when one apologizes, seeks forgiveness, when one communicates, when one commits himself, that has a chance of rebuilding the trust that was violated. And when you rebuild the trust, what are you doing? You are strengthening the link or the connection that was there before. Will it be the same? Well, time will tell. <laughs> it all depends how good of a job the two of them do. But it does have a chance of rebuilding the trust between them. There are different levels of sins. I said earlier that there's a sin that is more severe than others, depending if it was unintentional, if it was intentional. Yes, that definitely is a difference. Just to give you a little bit of an idea of what the Kabbalah says, or how the Kabbalah calls these various sins, I'm just going to briefly describe them to you. One is Selicha, one is Mehila, and one is Kapara. I'm sure you heard of these terms. But what do they actually mean? Most people do not know the difference between them. So I'm going to share with you, according to most opinions, what the difference is. There's different opinions. Mehila, which is the easiest one of all, is called forgiveness. But what really is happening is what's called in English absolving one of guilt. He was guilty. Hashem says, I absolve you. I acquit you. It was an infraction, something minor usually. All you did was regret it, you feel bad about it, you're pained by it. That's enough. If it's real, Hashem says, I absolve you. Baruch Hashem, great. Same thing between human beings. If it was minor, I forgive you. It's possible, it all depends what it was. That's called mehila, to absolve one of his guilt. Selicha is a lot more serious. Why do we need Selicha? Because whatever happened before, even though it was a minor infraction, it happened more than once. <laughs> it happened many, many times perhaps. You can't just ask mehila, 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 come on. So what happens is when things build up, many, many sins of minor infractions, or it could be a more serious infraction too, a more serious offense. Right? We have a list of what they are. For that, mehila is not enough. I feel bad. Hashem, please forgive me. No. You have to take action. You have to put in a lot more effort to get that selicha. To get the selicha where Hashem says, okay, I forgive and forget. You see, remember that expression? Let's forgive and forget. In order for that to happen between us and Hashem, or between human beings too, prove it. You gotta do a lot more than just apologize. You gotta prove it. So it takes a lot more work. And we don't have the time now to go through all the various actions that one can take to prove it. But there are certain things that he can do that will actually enable him to receive the Selicha of Hashem for whatever it is that he has done. However, that's not enough. Because let's say we achieve Behila. Let's say we achieve Selicha. Remember what we said earlier? There's a stain. Every offense, every head leaves behind a stain on the Neshama, the soul. 
That thing is not gone. The stain is not gone. Not completely. Depending on what it was, of course, that stain needs Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur means the day of atonement, where the stains are cleansed. Depending which stains, depending which sins, but many, many sins, along with proper teshuva, with proper repentance, which included the confession, it included the remorse, it included the commitment, you still need Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a holy day. It's such a special day where Hashem shows us how much He cares about us, that He enables us to start a new year without any baggage. Because that baggage, those sins from the past, remember, they are like stumbling blocks. They'll hurt us. We won't feel good about them. They won't allow our prayers to be accepted. So we need something that cleanses up, cleanses us completely. Otherwise, what happens is that that sin is on record. Remember that term that they use here? It's on record. They won't go after you. You won't go to jail now for it. But it's on record. It doesn't look good. When you apply for certain types of insurance or all kinds of things, they check your credit. They check, they check your record too. Your criminal record? You have a criminal record? Well, I don't know if we can trust you. <laughs> Maybe you are lying. It doesn't look good to have anything on our record. Thank God some things that have been on the record, they, say, they, they tell me, I don't know, thank God I don't know. After a few years, they take it off the record. You behave yourself. Well, I hope so. <laughs> but you really have to rebuild that credit. You really have to clean, clean up your record, if possible. With Hashem, it's easier. Hashem knows if we're faking, if we're lying or not. So Yom Kippur is necessary. It's necessary in order to be able to have a clean record, no stains left behind. Is it possible for a couple who really, really argued for many, many years, perhaps even divorced, to ever get back together? <laughs> that connection was severed. They really misbehaved. They were both at fault. Let's not just fault one of them. Both. It's still possible. Sure, if they forgive each other properly, if they say, let's just forgive and forget, let's just make up, it's possible if there's a major change in their lifestyle, in their beliefs, in their understanding of what went wrong and how can we avoid it in the future. If you don't understand what went wrong, how are you going to control it? How are you going to make sure it doesn't happen again? So when it comes to be the commandments of Hashem, it requires learning. Without learning, we can make mistakes again. Between husband and wife, it's not just about learning. Learning will be very helpful too. It's about making that commitment that I mentioned earlier. Okay, this is what did it. This is what's wrong. If we both can agree on what went wrong, then everything is possible. It's possible for them to get back together. They both have to be on the same page they say in English on the same exact page. We really messed it up. We were kids. We were just high school friends. You know, some people get married in high school. We just didn't know, we didn't realize. We made mistakes. But now we realize our mistakes. We both understand. And we really do care about each other. But, uh, you know, it's been very, very painful. But with proper guidance, and the two are good souls, they can do it. Yes, it's possible. How is atonement so powerful? This is something that most people, even though they pray and they fast on Yom Kippur, don't really know what's happening. What is this atonement that Hashem just atones? And I think from all the languages, actually, that describe atonement, English does an excellent job, even though I prefer the Spanish, Dia de Expiación, which I think in English there's also a word to expiate to erase, to eliminate the sin. I think the word atonement is a very interesting word that does more justice to, uh, to what this is and what is happening in Yom Kippur. You know where the word atonement comes from? To be one. Atone, look at the word atone. Atone is from the old English. To be united, to reconcile, to become one again. I think this is a great definition of what happens in Yom Kippur. 
Because what is happening when those sins are erased, when those ketamim, stains are removed, we can become one again with Hashem. We can become one again with our friends, husband and wife. Sins are atoned for, completely forgiven. If this is feasible, then why doesn't it always happen? Or not happen as much? There's a very good answer for this in Mishle, in Proverbs. Solomon reminds us, one of the greatest impediments to having a successful relationship, whether it's with us and Hashem, or whether it's with human beings, Whoever covers up his sins will not be successful. To cover up means not to admit them, not to acknowledge them, not to be aware of them. Also, don't cover them up. Admit them. Admit a wrong. It will be very helpful in your life, in any kind of relationship, husband and wife and with Hashem. Admit it. You made a mistake, admit it. That's the very first step. Otherwise, Solomon reminds us, Mechase, you cover up, you don't admit it, Lo Yatzliach, you will never succeed. You will never succeed to be able to control the problem and to improve or to heal the relationship. What's the continuation of the verse? What is the wise thing to do? Umoteh But whoever does admit, confess, and lets go, abandons his old bad ways, Yeruchan, they will have compassion over him. What a beautiful pasuk. <laughs> just be modern as if. Just admit it. It's so difficult <laughs> for a lot of people to do. Admit it and let go. Once you know that this is wrong, let go. Something so difficult for so many people to do. Let me share with you briefly a story that happened years ago. I think it was in Australia. Of a husband and wife who in the very beginning were fine, they got along. But the wife was very, very unhappy with their relationship because the husband wasn't so religious and did not treat her so well. It suffered, suffered very, very much. And even though they tried, they did try to make things work out, she just gave up one day on her husband and said, that's it, I want a divorce. They separated for a few months before the divorce. During the separation, the husband was at the rabbi's house. That's where he would go for Shabbat meals. Spending some time with the rabbi, the rabbi gave him attention, the rabbi taught him a little bit about Judaism, about how to be more committed. And little by little, this man did become more committed to Torah, did become more observant. Anyway, finally the day came to go to court. They were praying, the husband and the rabbi were praying during that morning. And because the court session was right away after the prayers, this man took with himself to the court his tefillin, his phylacteries. He didn't have time to go back home. And he took it with him to court. When the wife saw her husband in court with his phylacteries, she was fearful that the rabbi had given him a talisman. You know what a talisman is? Some powerful segula something that has incredible spiritual powers for him to win the case in court. Rabbi, it's not fair. You gave him, you got to give me something too. It's not fair. So the rabbi turns to the wife and says, no, 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 no. This is no talisman. This is nothing but what you think it is. In the past six months, your husband has changed a lot. He took upon himself now daily to put on this tefillin when he goes to pray in the morning. And he has become, therefore, more observant. Really? My husband has become more observant? He's taken upon himself to put on tefillin. I mean, she knew her husband. He was far from being religious. And she said to herself, you know what? If my husband can take this step and commit himself to changing his lifestyle by putting on tefillin, being more observant, I'm going to give him a chance because that shows that he can do it. If he did this, that means he can change. They got back together and they had a beautiful life. What did it take here? It took several things. It took, of course, commitment on the part of the man, but it also took understanding on the part of the woman that it's important to give this man a second chance. It's important to be forgiving. It's important to consider the entire picture that perhaps the two of you really were so distant from each other only because you had different ideologies, but you really are for each other. If you work together, you cooperate. 
and she was smart. She gave it a chance and it worked out. But don't think for a moment that forgiveness is only about giving someone a second chance. It's true. We forgive, we give this a chance. It's much more powerful than that. One of the positive consequences of forgiveness is what it does to us, to those of us who are forgiving someone else. Not just to what, what it does to the individual that we wronged. It feels good. Thank you for, for apologizing. What does it do to us? It's incredible. The Kabbalah teaches something very powerful. They will deal with you from above the way you deal with others, measure for measure. You're kind, compassionate, sensitive to others, forgiving of others, so will they be. When you did a wrong to God, the prosecuting angel will come out, they'll tell him, wait a minute, stop. He's forgiving with others. We will be forgiving with him. This is very powerful stuff. In other words, it, look what it does to us, to those of us who are forgiving. They will treat us the same from above. The rabbis tell us, that one who is strict, demanding, exacting, they will be exacting with him too. Very simple. That is why it's important to keep in mind that when somebody comes and asks you to forgive, don't be cruel. Obviously, it may need more than just asking for forgiveness. He may have to prove himself, he may have to do something to make amends for what he did. But don't be cruel, don't bear a grudge. Someone asks you for his forgiveness, forgive him. Because you're not only doing him a favor, of course, you're doing yourself a favor by being a forgiving person. And the rabbis tell us that that is one of the most powerful things that we can do that will earn us tremendous merit in the upper worlds. Hamavir al midotav, as it's called in Hebrew, one who is forgiving in nature. He doesn't always insist on being right. I'm right, he's wrong. That's it. No, <laughs> be forgiving. People make mistakes. Why is it like that? Why is it that being forgiving is so important? That Hashem is actually proud of us and says, we will be the same with you. Why? What happened? I was thinking about this and I came to the following conclusion. Hashem wants to really teach us a very important lesson. I am a forgiving God. I want you to be like me. That's all. I want to teach you how important it is to forgive. Learn it from me. I am forgiving. You're not any better than me. <laughs> if Hashem is willing to forgive and accept a wicked man's teshuvah, a wicked man, not an average individual who made a mistake, Wicked! His entire life he committed sins, but now he wants to make a U-turn. Seeks Hashem forgiveness. As long as he's still alive, <laughs> he can do so. Once you're dead, you can't. But even if it's the last day of one's life, Rabbi tells it will count. It may not be complete. There may be something called reincarnation that may have to come into play to make some reparations here. But at the very least, it counts. It counts a lot. So ask for forgiveness, no matter where you are, no matter what you did, because Hashem is forgiving, and therefore you also be forgiving of others. So what is forgiveness all about? Is it just to forgive? No, it's not just words. The following story will give you a better understanding of what true forgiveness is. Famous story with Rabbi Israel Salanter, blessed memory, great rabbi who lived in the 19th century. He was once traveling by train to his hometown. And in that same train was uh, an annoying individual. Let's call him annoying. Why? Why annoying? Because he was smoking a few seats away from the rabbi. And as he's smoking, he calls out to the rabbi, complaining, Rabbi, don't you see? I'm choking. Open the window. <laughs> he's smoking. And he's yelling at the rabbi, open the window. After a few minutes, he calls back to the rabbi, Rabbi, don't you see I'm cold? Close the window. He was a very annoying individual, complaining all the time, and yelling at the rabbi, not knowing who this rabbi was. Anyway, they finally arrived at the destination. This young man was going to the same destination. A Jewish fellow. And all of a sudden, he notices a tremendous big crowd. They came to receive the rabbi. And he asks the people, 
What were you here for? He says, you don't know. He was traveling on your train. Him, the rabbi. I can imagine how he felt. Terrible, terrible. He felt so bad. He came crying to the rabbi, please forgive me. I didn't know who you were, that I was so annoying. And the rabbi says, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. But tell me, what are you here for? I'll tell you the truth, rabbi. I, I came all the way here because I'm learning to, to slaughter animals. He wants to be a shohet. And I want to be ordained. I want to learn how to slaughter animals. And I want a certificate at the end of my training and exam so I can go and get a job. He says, I'll help you out. I'm going to get you the teacher. I'm going to have someone review with you the material so that you should do well on the exam. You have a place to stay? He says, no, I'm going to get you a place to stay. The rabbi went out of his way to help this young man. And some individuals knew what happened in the train. They told the rabbi, they asked him, Rabbi, it's okay if you forgive him. You know, that's nice, that's normal. But why did you go out of your way to help him so much? So the rabbi said, it's easy to forgive. I want to make sure that I have nothing against this individual. Nothing against him whatsoever. So I had to go out of my way to help him to do something opposite of what somebody else would do <laughs> if he was upset. To make sure it's, I get it out of me. Not just to forgive with words, but to actually help the individual who annoyed you. That's real forgiveness. What's the difference between nowadays and in the past? A very important difference. In the past, we had korbanot, sacrifices. And many, many non-Jews are very puzzled by these sacrifices. What did the sacrifice do for you? They don't understand why we brought sacrifice. Kill an animal as a sacrifice. It is something mystical, of course, but it is also something quite simple to understand. In the past, the animals that were brought as a sacrifice to atone for a sin was basically usually intended to atone for an unintentional sin. Shgagot, chatat, something that was unintentional. Not for something that was unintentional. A sacrifice would not help. The sacrifice was symbolic for the most part. It reminded you, you acted like an animal without using your brains. Why didn't you study? Why didn't you pay attention? You would have not made this mistake. But you acted like an animal. You're bringing an animal as a sacrifice. You acted like an animal that does not have brains. That does not think that you're a human being. You do have brains. Be careful next time. The animal therefore humbled him. It helped humble him and remind him how he stooped so low to do something that he should not have done had he been more careful, had he studied. But today we don't have the sacrifices, we don't have the temple. How do we atone? How do we seek Hashem's forgiveness? Besides praying and besides feeling remorseful, don't we need sacrifices? And many, many Christians actually use this as an example. You see, guys, you need blood, and you don't have the blood anymore. And obviously they have their own agenda with what kind of blood they think would be necessary to atone. Judaism is totally against that. It's not the blood. It's not the sacrifice. Hashem really wants our prayers, our remorse, much more than anything else. And those sacrifices didn't help us if, it were, if they were intentional sins anyway. What would you do for an intentional sin? A sacrifice, a thousand sacrifices will not help you. So blood has nothing, zero, to do with atonement. It was symbolic. But today, what we have is what we always had for intentional sins. Tzedakah in dinim kashim. Tzedakah is charity. Helping someone else, very powerful. It somehow repairs the relationship between us and Hashem. In dinim kashim, when one does not do any charity, or when one does not ask Hashem for forgiveness, he's not remorseful, then Hashem says, you know, I care about you. I want to clean you up. I don't want you to head upstairs after you leave this world with all these stains, I'm going to send you dinim kashim. Harsh decrees. You're going to lose some money here. You're going to get sick over here. You're going to have some surgeries here. You're going to have a flat tire. You're going to have a root canal. <laughs> You're going to have all kinds of pain and suffering ordeals. They are called dinim, judgments. Difficult judgments. But it's all with compassion and all with the precise measure that one needs. This always existed and still does today. We don't know always why things happen to us. But we just, we just need to remember 
it's up to us to accept it properly with love and with happiness. Thank God I'm being cleansed in this world and not in the world to come above. It's better to pay here, not there. All of this is in order to help us with Teshuvah. So with Dinim Kashim, this could be whether the act was done unintentional or whether it was done intentional. Judgments could come for all kinds of reasons. One of the most powerful Dinim, one of the most powerful judgments is when somebody is embarrassed. He was humiliated and he didn't answer back. Because if you answer back and you try to defend yourself, it counts but not as much. You want it to count a lot? Don't say anything. Accept it. It's coming to me. Somehow, I needed to hear this. I needed to experience this. It's all from above. Nothing happens for no reason. Remember that? So, bushot, shame, embarrassment, humiliation. Powerful, powerful dinim. And a powerful kapara as well. So this kind of a judgment, remember, is for your good, for your benefit. Don't answer back if you don't need to. The more a person purifies himself, cleanses himself, takes action to get closer and closer to Hashem, the less he will feel attracted to his old ways, to the sinful ways. If one continues to struggle, if he finds himself being tempted time after time, again and again, and, God forbid, stumbling, falling, that means his Teshuvah was never 100%. If the Teshuvah is really complete, it's strong, it's sincere, then eventually at some point he won't be attracted to this. He won't want to go back to his old ways. The temptation may come here and there, but he won't struggle. If you find yourself struggling with the same sins that you let go, that means that you haven't let go completely. That's all it means. You're still closer to that than to the other way. You want to be close to Hashem, you want to be close to proper Teshuvah, then it requires a tremendous amount of work. And when you reach that point where you see, I'm no longer so interested in that, that's a good sign. That means that probably your Teshuvah has been accepted and you're on your way to removing all the stains that may have been there before. Very important to keep in mind not to push off seeking forgiveness from Hashem or from another human being that we may have wrong. Don't push it off. If you push it off, first of all, you may never get around to asking forgiveness. A person may die all of a sudden without ever having apologized or sought forgiveness. Don't push it off. Pushing it off also makes things more difficult. Imagine a husband and wife that haven't apologized to each other for 20 years. What has accumulated over 20 years are scabs, bruises, that never healed. They were never given a chance to heal. What did we say before, an apology will heal? They never healed. Now they decided to go to a marriage counselor. You should do this, you should do that. No, I'm not interested anymore. I've lost feelings for him or for her. Yes, after a while you lose feelings for the person. You've never given yourself a fair chance of healing. The worst, of course, if they got divorced. Don't wait. Don't push it off. Allow it to heal. How? Apologize. Seek forgiveness. What if the person passed away? Go to the grave. Yeah, that's what the Allah says. Go to the grave and ask forgiveness. I'm sorry what I may have done. I didn't realize. I'm sorry. I feel bad. He's no longer alive. Yes, go to his grave. If it's too far, send people to seek forgiveness. He'll know about it, he'll find out about it. Don't think that just because he's dead he won't find out about it. It counts. So what? Better than nothing. As they say in English and in other languages, better late than never. Regardless of, of the forgiveness that you're seeking from your spouse or from a friend, better late than never. But to push off is not a good idea. Just like to end with a very important detail that many, many people simply forget. Here we're talking about forgiveness, how important it is, how positive it could be, how it could help heal. A lot of people make the mistake of not forgiving themselves. Themselves. They feel guilty. They feel bad. They don't forgive themselves. The rabbis warn us, Al rasha in the Kabbalah, in the ethics of our fathers. Don't consider yourself a wicked man. 
I'm wicked. I did this and I did that. I have no hope. I've done all these sins. Forgive yourself. Be very careful not to consider yourself a wicked man. Otherwise, you will not have too much hope. You will lose hope. And that's no good. That's dangerous. That's not healthy at all. <laughs> so, here we're talking about the importance of forgiveness. Don't forget to forgive yourself. What will this do for you when you forgive yourself? It will actually make you feel a free man. You will be liberating yourself from the jail that you put yourself into. Not the jail that others put you into. Your own jail that you've created, the thoughts that you have in your mind, dangerous thoughts. You will feel true freedom when you forgive yourself and give yourself a chance in hope. Therefore, in conclusion, forgiveness is the missing link to the most powerful of bonds, the bond between human beings and the bond between man and Hashem. I want to wish you all a Shana Tova, a Ktiva Tova. We should all be inscribed in the Book of the Living. Amen. Amen.